Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, we're happy that we've had you join us here today for our Food Preservation at Home series. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Hope Klein. I'm a Health Education and Food Safety Field Specialist with SDSU Extension. This is the seventh session of the series, which runs through September 22nd. The sessions occur every two weeks, and each session is a new food preservation topic. We're covering a variety of different food preservation methods during these last couple of weeks. And on this next slide, you're able to see what sessions we have remaining throughout the series. So two weeks from today, we will be covering dehydrating. And then four weeks from today, we have our very last session, which is going to be on pressure canning meats. Today, we have Megan Erickson, who's going to be talking to us about freezing. And some questions were submitted um, as individuals registered that are gonna be addressed live during the session. But if you have any additional questions as Megan works through her presentation, feel free to type them in the chat box and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. But before I introduce Megan, I do want to ask all of you to use the chat box. So you'll see a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We want you to put in your name, where you're located, and then what is your favorite food to freeze or maybe just to enjoy. And then also we're gonna have a little bit of fun. We're gonna ask you the oldest frozen item in your freezer. <laughs> And before we get started with that, um, maybe as you're thinking about your favorite frozen food item and the oldest item from your in your freezer, I'm gonna launch a couple of polling questions. And this is just kind of to gauge your knowledge on um, freezing practices before we get started. So you should see the first question pop up now, and it's just asking for your knowledge on current practices for freezing. How confident are you? I'm gonna leave it for about five more seconds. Okay, I'll share the results so you can see where everybody is at. Um, we're a little bit across the board, but for the most part, uh, people are feeling confident. Okay, and then I've got another question. Oops. Okay, so now you should see the next question on your ability to follow safe practices for freezing. How confident are you that you are doing it correctly and in the safest manner? Okay, I'm gonna share those results. Again, we're pretty equal across the board, maybe a little less confidence with this question. All right, and then I have one more. All right, so knowing where to go for safe research tested recipes for freezing foods. All right, and we got everybody. So a little all over the board with that one as well. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, now I'm gonna introduce Megan. Megan Erickson is a nutrition field specialist based in the Aberdeen Regional Center. Megan shares her knowledge as a registered dietitian nutritionist to support individuals and families live a lifestyle balanced with healthy nutrition and physical activity practices. She started canning at a young age with her grandma and over the years has made many memories of freezing corn. So Megan, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And just a reminder for anybody that has a question as Megan works through her presentation, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Okay, I loved those questions and I was like, I don't even know if I wanna share what the oldest food item in my freezer is. It's probably like, I just have read Jeanette's and the oldest thing in my freezer is unidentifiable. <laughs> that is just great. So thanks everybody for um, sharing where you're from, you're joining from, and I'm excited to talk about freezing foods because um, it's actually one of my one of my favorite things to kind of preserve the food a little bit longer, and it's so quick and easy. 
All right. So freezing food, why, why should we, why should we do it? And what are the benefits? So it saves money, you know, it reduces food waste. Your family then is eating out less. You can make your own convenient foods that kind of a little, maybe a little bit healthier versus, you know, buying those frozen foods at the grocery store, maybe a little less salt, more, um, less preserves. Um, and you can also freeze foods that you've bought on sale. So again, you're saving money in the long haul. Um, and another thing is, and this is one of my favorite things, is it increases family time. Um, so if you have freezer meals or any kind of frozen foods, they're quick and accessible. It improves nutrition by eating meals prepared at home. It's easy and takes little time. Your family can help prep and you can make your meal together. I know I love getting, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and I love getting them in the kitchen to help. Um, gets a little messy at times, but that's the fun part. And you can, yeah, have family join in. And you just get to spend overall more time. And the re reason behind that is research shows that eating out costs more money than eating at home, as we can probably identify. So having maybe some main dishes frozen and ready ahead of time, the temptation to just like, oh, what's for supper? Oh, let's just run to Dairy Queen or, you know, wherever to eat out, it's lessened. So um, it's shown that we can eat, actually eat healthier when we eat at home. Okay, so the science behind freezing foods, what is happening? Um, so really it slows the microorganism growth. So freezing doesn't kill or eliminate it just slows that growth. Um, there's slow chemical changes that is, that is occurring, and I'll go over those um, in a couple slides. But also, um, all, and all food has some water. And as we know, some foods have more water than none, and the higher the water content, your product may not be as desirable. So ice crystals form within you know, our cell walls when frozen and those cell walls may rupture. So that is gonna be what results in a lower quality or undesirable texture when thawed. I'm just initially thinking of like lettuce. Lettuce, you know, you put, that's kind of a high water content. You're gonna put it in the freezer, you're gonna take it out and it's likely those cell walls may have ruptured and it's gonna be mushy and gross and not that crispness that we usually have with lettuce. Um, but to present, prevent some of these, um, maybe some of these changes that occurs, we want to freeze fast and then that results in smaller ice crystals. So then the quality will be a lot better. All right, so like I said, the rate of freezing is very important. We want to move quickly, um, typically in smaller batches is nice. Um, and we want to move quickly just for a better texture when that food is thawed. All right, so some of the chemical changes. So enzymes, so foods are made that have enzymes in them. And that's what call, causes color, flavor, and nutrient changes. So I always think of when I cut an apple up and leave it on the counter, I may forget about it and come back and you may notice that it's maybe a little bit brown. Um, still good to eat, just has a different color. Those enzymes are what is changing that color. Um, vegetables should be blanched. So um, vegetables, that's what helps destroy the microorganisms. It stops that enzyme action. So there aren't any color changes. Um, it helps retain that flavor and retain those nutrients. Um, fruits sometimes need browning prevention. So like your peaches or apples, um, there's fret, fret, I can never say this word, fruit fresh lemon juice, ascorbic acid, um, these all um, help um, just kind of retain color in our fruits and it helps prevent vitamin C loss that can occur. Also products contain, containing fat can become rancid. So um, we wanna make sure that we wrap our foods tightly to remove all that air because air and that fat, that is what's gonna cause that process to, and your food is going to be rancid. Um, it's just another natural change that occurs in fatty foods. It's not really a common problem in fruits and veggies, um, but it can 
it can occur but typically more maybe with your meats. Um, so making sure those are tightly wrapped. Um, and it's also better that, you know, you want to make sure that your freezer has an appropriate temperature. You don't want it in a warm environment. That's not going to be good. All right, another thing that occurs with freezing is texture changes. I wish that we could put, you know, a produce in the freezer and it come out exactly the same. That crispness um, sometimes is impossible. Um, so the water and food freezes and then expands. And that's the ice crystals call, um, cause those cell walls of fruits and vegetables to rupture, making them softer when they are thawed. So like I said, some vegetables that have kind of that higher water content that probably don't really freeze well, um, celery, lettuce, you know, sometimes if I have a produce that is maybe a little bit more mushy or the quality didn't turn out as good, um, especially, you know, some produce like lettuce or, you know, some fruits that are maybe a little bit more mushy, I just like to blend them up in my smoothie um, because it's blend, it blends up really nice then. Um, so yeah, you're going to result in a softer texture. You want to freeze as quickly as possible. Um, read your freezer manual to make sure you know, that your freezer is set at a low enough temperature and that it keeps up with all of the food that is in your freezer. Um, you don't want to overload your, your freezer um, because then it's just working extra hard to keep up with it. And we don't want your freezer to stop working and have all of that food spoil. Um, so set your freezer temperature um, to the, you know, to the appropriate temperature. And another thing is freezer burn. Um, those foods that have been in my freezer a long time, I can guarantee they have freezer burn just because they've been in there a while, or maybe the product wasn't um, an appropriate container. Um, this unfortunately is not, um, not reversible. So for best quality, you know, we want our freezer at zero degrees um, Fahrenheit. Again, read, read your freezer manual. Um, a lot of people tend to just like throw the manual out or disregard it, but it can kind of hold some useful tips and tricks on your freezer. Or it may tell you like, oh, this is the best place in your freezer to have this type of product. Um, you know, uh, so the, it may have some good, good tips for you. Okay, freezer containers, and there are so many out there. Um, I typically just tend to use freezer bags, but I do have some containers that I love, especially for my soups. If I have a lot of um, leftover soup, I love to freeze soup. Um, but you wanna make sure that it's moisture vapor resistant, leak proof, you don't wanna mess in your freezer. You wanna be able to withstand freezing temperatures, so you don't want any containers that are gonna crack. Um, you want it to resist grease, oil, water, prevent any off flavors or off odors. Um, sometimes, you know, in our freezers, it can, um, can give a slight different odor. So making sure that you have a tight seal. Um, you want to be able to label it because if you're like me, things get lost in the bottom of my chest freezer. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I wonder how old that is. Um, most of the time it has, you know, if you're buying freezer foods, it will have an expiration date. But if you're preserving your own foods, it's just always nice to label it. Um, you don't want your con containers to crack or become brittle. And another thing to remember is headspace. As food freezes, it expands. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're allowing at least, you know, about a half an inch of headspace for allow that food expansion um, so that food doesn't spill out and seep all over. All right, it will, there we go. Um, like I said, freezer bags are typically my go-to. Um, actually, this picture on here is from when I froze, um, froze some of my corn last year. Um, so we wanna freeze foods in thinner, flatter shapes and bags it's easier. It just makes it nice to stack and the food will freeze a lot quickly if it's more flat versus plump full. Um, that middle of that bag will take a lot longer to freeze. Um, just thus, the quality may not be as, you know, as good, but we want to freeze as quickly as possible. Um, so you place your um, filled bags in a single layer on a flat surface, surface until frozen, and then it's just nice and easy to stack. 
Um, another, you know, a lot of other people can use tin foil, you know, just kind of wrapping it, bringing the scent, putting the food on the foil, center it, bring opposite sides and fold, and then the other sides and fold, and you, it just folds up really nice and snug um, with that double, um, that double fold. You know, you want to avoid foil when storing high acid foods, such as maybe your tart fruits or foods made with vinegar, like a tomatoes or tomato sauce. Um, those typically that can cause a reaction and the acid in these foods, it interacts with that aluminum and it can cause um, pin prick holes in the foil and then cause a metallic taste, which is not probably the best outcome. So just kind of avoid that type of container um, method. All right, packing and late, oops, got a little slide happy. Um, packing and labeling foods, um, again, like I said, it's it's easy, like, well, obviously you can tell this is corn, but we have um, this one, we put corn, August 2020, um, label you, with the name of the food, date, um, sometimes number of servings is good. I like to do this with my zucchini when I grind it up or ground it up. Um, that way, if I'm making zucchini bread or muffins, I like to, you know, most recipes either call maybe for one cup or two cup. That way it's already proportioned out and I don't have to mess with anything. So I just pull a, um, pull a bag out. Um, if you're making a freezer meal, maybe how to prepare it. Um, so if it's, you know, if you're cooking from frozen, you know, set your oven to this temperature, cook for 30 minutes or an hour, or if it's thawed, do this way, any helpful information. Um, I tend to forget things, so I like to write as many notes to myself as possible. Okay, and I, this has been um, a pretty popular question this year, especially um, just, you know, COVID, a lot of people are um, growing, starting more gardens, growing their own food, preserving their own food. Um, there's actually, it's hard to find a freezer nowadays sometimes. Um, and people are wondering how long can I store my foods? Um, so this is um, just kind of an approximation of how much if you know, if stored at the appropriate temperature and prepared correctly, you know, fruits and vegetables, typically anywhere eight to 12 months, poultry, six to nine months, ground meat, you know, you can see three to four months, cured or processed meat, one to two months. Um, yeah, my food, that food that's been in my freezer the longest way is way longer than this. So I should probably throw that out. Um, but this is just for safe, um, for your shelf life of your frozen foods um, that's based on the type of food. And another question you want, questions you want to think about is, was the food properly blanched? Um, was the food packaged in appropriate materials? Um, was the food stored at an acceptable temperature? These will all affect the quality of the food. Um, and if you're doing like sweet corn, you know, if you had Two row, I'm, not, I'm just thinking of some are the way we do it is we plant two rows this time and then two rows maybe a couple weeks out. And so you want to use the first, um, the method first in, first out. So you want to rotate your food so you're using the older items first and enjoy that food at the best quality. All right, so thawing, safe thawing practices. Um, you can use refrigerator, microwave as part of the cooking process. Um, for best quality and safety, I will tell you the to thaw foods in the refrigerator at 40 degrees or less. Um, sometimes I just don't plan that far out and I have to use the microwave. Um, so if I do use the microwave to thaw my foods, um, it's best to make sure that you're cooking that food right away. Um, as part of the cooking process, you know, it's nothing better than throwing in a roast in the morning, in the middle of winter, and then by the time you get home, it's done. Um, and also kind of that planning stage. On average, it takes 24 hours to thaw five pounds of food. So if we're thinking about Thanksgiving, um, having our big turkeys, you know, preparing enough of, you know, we typically, they're frozen, if they're frozen, okay, how many days do I need to put it in the refrigerator to thaw 
so it's completely thawed by the time it needs to be cooked. And um, I know my husband, I'm going to call out my husband, I know, remember before we were married, he would take hamburger out and just set it on the counter to thaw, and I'm like, what are you doing? That is not safe. That's the danger zone. And he goes, what's the danger zone? I'm like, you know, I'm like the bad temperatures. So the danger zone is we don't want temperatures between 40 and 140 degrees. That's where bacteria thrives and just multiplies and grows and your food can spoil. Um, so we want to avoid the danger zone. So by taking these safe practices when um, freezing foods and, <coughs> excuse me, when thawing our foods. All right, so kind of let's get into the different ways that we can, um, I'm gonna talk about different packing methods with our fruits and vegetables. So fruits can be frozen in many forms, whole, sliced, crushed juice. Um, obviously the best quality is, you know, you want the optimum maturity and freshness, maybe avoid overripe, that's gonna maybe lower the quality when frozen. Um, there's all of these different packs you can do, um, a syrup pack, <clears throat> you'll get a good texture. Um, the syrup's technically not needed for safety reasons, um, but fruits should be covered with the syrup and then placed in your container. Sugar pack, um, sliced, often your sliced, fruit, um, your sliced soft fruits, so strawberries, peaches, they make their own syrup when mixed with the right proportion of sugar. So you can layer your fruit and sugar in a bowl or pan allow for it to you know stand for about 15 minutes and it makes its own juice or syrup before packing so that's another different method um, if you want more of maybe a healthier version or just don't want to mess with the syrup or sugar you can do a dry pack um, so that's good for whole berries um, blueberries strawberries um, raspberries um, you you don't need sugar you just simply pack into containers and freeze or it can be frozen individually in a single layer. So on this picture on my slide, you can see where it's on a tray. Um, you put the, that tray in the freezer and wait until they're frozen, and then you can put them into your container. And this will um, prevent them from freezing in one big clump. And then you can take out individual proportions that you need for your recipe. And the fruit pieces retain their shapes and then they don't clump. Um, and then also there's a pectin syrup that you can do that's good for strawberries and peaches. Um, you just measure out, you know, your proportion of packaged powder pectin and water, bring to a boil, remove from heat, and then um, you pour that over your fruit. Or you can use fruit, uh, or not fruit, water. Um, the texture is going to be mushier. Your color is going to be not as good. It kind of tends to freeze hard, takes longer to thaw. So that would probably be more of an undesirable method, but is still an option. Um, there are sugar substitutes. Um, so maybe used in the pectin syrup, juice, or water packs that you could do if you're looking for a low calorie option. Um, they don't, just as an, a heads up, it doesn't help to retain the color or texture like the sugar does. Um, and you want to make sure you use amounts on product labels or just to taste. So everybody has their own sweetness that they like. Um, or you could um, always sprinkle like your Splenda or Stevia um, or any kind of sugar substitute um, after the fruit is thawed um, to give it a little bit of sweetness. All right, so prevent darkening. So this is that chemical change that happens with our produce. Um, so to prevent this, you know, the most economical would likely be the ascorbic acid. So you take powdered or a tablet form of that ascorbic acid. Um, tablets must be crushed well, and then you mix it to one gallon of cool water. Um, so there's a commercial ascorbic acid, acid mis mixture. Um, you can heat the fruit. That also prevents, can help prevent some darkening. And the following um, don't work, it still work, but don't work as well. Um, so citric acid solution, lemon juice. I know the lemon juice works. Um, it may mask the flavors of some of the fruits. So there are alternatives. So whatever uh, method works best for you. Steaming um, works really well for fruits 
um, that will be cooked before using. So just follow directions and um, in many of our freezing publications, I, I'll be bringing up later for different times. All right, so now we're gonna switch to vegetables um, and packing our vegetables. So before even we know, we wanna make sure that we're selecting that young, tender, high quality vegetables. Um, sort for size and ripeness, you know, prep them according to um, how you, are they sliced, diced, do you leave them whole? Um, wash and drain before removing any skins. Work in small quantities. Um, that works a lot better. Um, making sure that you don't let them soak in water because you know our vegetables already have a good water content. We don't want to add to it. And work in small quantities, um, preparing as directed. And with vegetables, we want to blanch. Um, so what is blanching? So like I said, it's the primary method to destroy enzymes for vegetables. It's the process of quickly heating and cooling the produce. It helps to brighten color, slows loss of vitamins. It helps to soften the vegetables. Um, and blanching properly, you have to blanch properly for each produce and each produce item or vegetable has its own time that it needs to be blanched. So tomatoes are going to be different than carrots and corn. So depending on what type, you're going to have a little bit different time. And there's different methods of blanching. There's water, steam, microwave. Um, blanching is not required for safety purposes, but if you want the best quality of produce, then you'll need to blanch. All right, so blanching time varies, like I said, um, based on the type of vegetable, size. Um, I said that quickly heating and cooling. Rapid cooling is key. You wanna quickly place um, the produce in a large bowl of ice water, or I simply just fill up my sink um, full of water and ice and dump my produce in there. You want to be careful of under blanching and over blanching and under blanching stimulates that activity of the enzyme and sometimes is worse than no blanching at all. Um, and over blanching, it can cause a loss of flavor, color, vitamins and minerals. Um, I don't know why they have to be so picky with us. Um, but so making sure that you know the time based on what food that you're doing um, will ensure the best quality of product for you. And I'm going to go over a few methods of blanching. The first one being water blanching. Um, you just fill a pot full of one gallon of water, or if you're doing more, <coughs> excuse me, one gallon of water per pound of produce is typically recommended. You'll lower your vegetables um, into vigorously boiling water, put the lid on, and here's the key, you wanna make sure the water starts boiling again before you start your timer. If, your pro if you put your produce, if it doesn't start to boil within one minute, you have too much produce. So then the next batch just alter that. You wanna make sure that it starts to boil fairly rapidly. You just may, like again, work in small batches. It may just take a little bit, a couple more steps, but you're gonna um, be getting the best produce. Another method is microwave blanching. Um, it may not be as effective. Food is still safe. Um, it may reduce quality. And the thing with microwave blanching, every microwave is different. You just wanna make sure that you're following your manufacturer's, manufacturer's directions. And there typically are times and limits uh, for your microwave um, based on which produce you are blanching. All right, and here is steam blanching. So you'll just have one to two inches of water in the bottom of the pot. And you can see on this picture, it kind of has an insert or a basket that fits in. So you'll lower the produce in a single layer basket into the pot and cover it with a lid and start timing. Um, steaming takes a little bit longer than water blanching, but still, still a good method to blanch. And then with vegetables, you can do a dry pack <clears throat> excuse me, a dry pack. So you pack the vegetable, um, pack after the ve vegetables are blanched, cooled, and drained. Um, pack quickly, pushing the air out as you work towards the top. Remember, you want to push all of that air out. Um, or tray pack. You can, after draining, spread them on your tray, put them in the freezer, wait until they are firm, 
and then you can put them into your package again working quickly um, time is time is key here you want to work pretty quickly when um, freezing your produce and again just as a reminder frozen vegetables will maintain high quality for 8 to 12 months at zero degrees Fahrenheit or lower And I don't know if I've been in this situation before. Oops, my freezer's off, or there's been an unexpected power outage that's lasted longer, or an ice storm that cuts our power. Um, so if you know your power will be off, set your freezer controls on 10 or 20 de degrees Fahrenheit below. So minus 10 or minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit below immediately, um, just to get it a little bit colder. Don't open the door. I know it's so tempting to open the door and be like, okay, is my food still cold? Or, oh, I just need to get something quick. Try to avoid that because every time that you open that door, you're letting warm air in. Um, foods stay frozen longer if the freezer is full, well insulated in a cool area. So typically, you know, if I get calls, oh, my freezer, last power, is my food still good? Um, I, these are some of the questions that I ask. So if you have a full freezer, it typically um, keeps your food two to four days. And if you're a half full freezer, 24 hours. Um, so I like to check, I typically check after it's happened to us before, I keep a close eye on my freezer and making sure, especially if I've gotten, um, we typically buy like a quarter, quarter beef or you know, a hog. Um, so we have our freezers full of meat that I don't want to lose. And unfortunately, I have been the bearer of bad news where I've had to tell people that I'm so sorry your freezer of your ground beef is all bad and it has to be, it has to be thrown out. We don't want you getting sick. Um, so you can refreeze thawed foods. Um, the texture will not be as good, but a general rule is, you know, if you refreeze, you, um, if freezer temperature is still 40 degrees or below, or if there's ice crystals um, still present on the food, um, it's the, these measures, so making sure, I have a thermometer in my freezer, um, so that's another good thing to have, that way you know what the temperature is. Um, texture may not be as good, but still safe if following these um, these precautions. All right, some of our resources that we have, and I think Hope will drop those links in our chat. So SDSU Extension has our Pick It, Try It, Like It, Preserve It resources. And I just have a couple up here, tomatoes and rhubarb. So we have a variety of different produce items and um, the different preserving methods. So we talked on freezing, but if you're interested in either water bath canning or pressure canning or maybe drying, we're gonna be covering that in two weeks, but these are some resources for you to go and check out. And like tomatoes, like it will go through the process of how to freeze your tomatoes. How long should we, how long should we be blanching? Um, so these are just some fun resources. Um, on our website, we also have um, an article. If you have excess produce, sometimes we just can't get through all our produce. If it's especially on sale, you know, we, I can never give, give up a good deal. Um, so what can you do with that excess produce to make it last longer instead of having to throw it out? Um, we wanna try to prevent that food waste. And then um, I think there is a freezer meal um, publication that we have. So if you're interested, it's a, actually a freezer meal workshop. Um, so it has a variety of different uh, recipes that you can make ahead of time so that your freezer is full of meals. So if you're like me and get home and don't feel like cooking or didn't prepare, um, you have those kind of on hand that you can just pop into the oven and you are set to go. All right, I think that is all I have. I ha hope you've been monitoring the chat. Are there any questions? In the chat, but I have put in all of the resources that you mentioned, as well as the video of you in your kitchen um, on freezing. Oh, carrots. yes. <laughs> yes, so if you want to join, if you want to yeah, join me I in my kitchen. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I froze some carrots earlier today. Hope and I were 
we're kind of star um, stars in our videos, our food preservation videos. So yes, I did a freezer freezer one, so you can join me in my kitchen on learning more on that. Yes. Okay, we do have a couple of questions coming in, Megan. So the first one is from Jeanette, and she is asking, how do you freeze shredded zucchini? Oh, yeah. That you can basically, I, what I do is I basically shred it and I put it in my freezer container. <clears throat> I use freezer bags and you literally just put it in your freezer. Um, I like to um, peel mine. I know some people leave the peels on them, but I like to peel mine and I put it through. I have a grinder um, on my mixer. It's an attachment on my mixer that you can um, shred and you literally just Sometimes you can, um, zucchini is pretty uh, high water content. Um, so sometimes I even like to leave it a little bit in the strainer to get rid of some of that ex excess water and then put it directly into your freezer container and put it in your freezer and it's good to go. All right, what is the best way to freeze corn still on the cob? There is, so on our corn, so if you go to the preserve it, um, publications and maybe Hope can pull it up on her computer too or I could probably um, pull it up too um, but you can blanch your corn on the cob it just I think you blanch it for a little bit longer I want to say for small ears it's about four minutes I could be wrong um, but if you go to our preserve it um, and then you just blanch it put it in um, your bowl of cold water and put it into your freezer bags or freezer containers and stick it into your freezer. And we'll find that answer for you, Paula. Good question. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this so I can. Next one, how would you freeze green tomatoes, blanch first or what? Yeah, so tomatoes you can either blanch. I know some people who just put their tomatoes whole um, into whole in freezer bags and put them into the freezer with skins on and everything. Um, depending on what you what purpose you're what you're going to be using your tomatoes for. Um, if you don't want the skins, I would blanch first and then put into cold water. Those skins are obviously going to be removed a lot easier. Perfect. Hope just dropped corn on the cob. Was I, oh, I was way off. Seven minutes, not four minutes. So I'm glad Hope found that. Um, so green tomatoes, yes, blanch. So depending on, Jim, depending on what you want to use them with, um, but you can blanch them or you can um, just put them directly into your freezer whole. And what about rhubarb? Cut it first or freeze in stocks? I got this one, Megan. Oh, perfect. So I just dropped it in the chat box, Jeanette, um, but I actually went to the National Center for Home Food Preservation on this one, but it just says to wash, trim, and cut into lengths to fit the package. And then to blanch it in boiling water for one minute, cool promptly like Megan has mentioned to help retain that color and flavor. Yeah, I have, um, I have some rhubarb in my freezer right now. And when I thaw it, again, it's a high water content. So I like to either set it on some paper, a bowl of paper towels, um, just to kind of get rid of some of that excess water before I put it into like a, a, rhubarb, a rhubarb dessert so it doesn't get a little bit more mushy. Good questions. Now everybody's gonna go out and freeze this weekend. Yeah, I just froze some, I did corn. Um, I typically freeze carrots. So my carrots are gonna be, when those are done, I like to freeze my carrots. Um, I actually froze some peaches this year. Um, I was kind of getting lazy in my water bath canning. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna try some, I'm gonna do something different this year. And I actually froze some peaches that I plan to probably just stick into smoothies um, for later. Perfect, and Hope um, dropped in the Preserve It resource on rhubarb. Any tricks on freezing soup? Perfect, thanks Hope for finding that green tomatoes. 
Phrasing soup. So I love phrasing soup. Um, I The only thing I would recommend is making sure that you had at least that half inch of head space um, before you freeze it because the, the soup will expand. I've actually had some seep out. So I was like, oh, I, I, you know, I don't want to waste it. I want to get it in my container, squeeze as much as I can in the container. Um, but that would be the only thing. So, and if I have leftover soup and we have a bunch of it and we're getting sick of it, I'll throw it into freezer containers um, and stick it in the freezer. And it's awesome just to bring back out and rethaw. But no, a lot of soups freeze really well. And depending on the thickness or if you like it a more thin, like our cream-based soups, you may have to maybe add a little bit of cream or milk to it. Or if you need to thicken it, you may have to add the thickening agent, um, depending on your preference. Or if you don't like your salmon, keep going. Or if your vegetables, depending on if you don't want them, sometimes they can get a little bit mushy. So you can add things to your soup as it's thought, you know, in a crock pot, you can add it afterwards. Soups are super versatile. Yes, Paula, there is a shortage on seal, on lids. Um, so yeah, we may find ourselves freezing a little bit more, or if you're like me and are running out of freezer space, um, you may be doing more of canning if you do have some jars and lids. So kind of the best of both worlds. And yes, Jim says he's been using vacuum packers now for decades for fish, game, and more. Works extremely well. I was actually going to, my brother has a vacuum packer, and I was going to borrow his to see if I would like it so then I could invest in one. So that's, that's next on my to-do. So those are really good in um, driving all of the air out of our produce or out of the container. It seals very well. Any other questions? I'm going to launch the post polling questions. So you're going to see the same questions as when we started. And this is just um, allowing Megan and myself to gauge your change in knowledge and confidence. Um, so just think about those last minute questions. And let me get this pulled back up. All right, so you should see that first polling question again on your knowledge on current practices for freezing. I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds. We're still waiting for a couple of responses. Okay, I'll share the results. So we have moved in the right direction, which is great. People increasing their confidence level. All right, number two out of three. How do you feel about your ability to follow safe practices for freezing? Doing good on that one. Again, people's confidence level has increased, so that's wonderful to see. And then the last one we have, knowing where to go for safe research tested recipes for freezing foods. And we've moved up on that one as well. So that is great for us to see, just that everyone's confidence level has moved up. Um, so I gave you guys a second to see if you had any last minute questions. It doesn't look so. Um, Jim said, another great session, always picks up on some great tips and references. 
Thank you, Jim, for that positive feedback. That is always great to hear. Yes, freezing corn. That's my favorite thing to freeze, I think, too. Okay, I am dropping Megan and my emails in the chat box if you would like to save them at all, um, just to reach out whenever you need to if you have additional questions. Otherwise, you can find all of our resources on the Extension website um, and find our contact information there as well. So just as a reminder, we have two more sessions in this food preservation series. So two weeks from today, we'll, we'll be covering dehydrating. And then four weeks from today will be our final session and we'll be talking about pressure canning meats. Thanks again to everybody that joined us and we hope you have a great day. Thanks.